what are some of your key considerations when dealing with Australian rules footballers from a from a GPS reporting point of view? Yeah, no problem. So it's actually obviously timely that uh, I've followed on from from Jared. So there's going to be some similarities here because I think we obviously share a pretty similar philosophy on it. But I guess one of the key things for me is ensuring that your uh, GPS metrics are valid and reliable. So um, based on some of the metrics that, that uh, Jared alluded to using, he clearly has uh, slightly more sophisticated GPS units than me. So um, th that valid and reliability concept is, is obviously unit dependent. So there's obviously, um, uh, I guess, with the advent of, of um, less expensive GPS units now, um, they're, they're, I guess, more widely accessible across schools. So we have um, probably, we use a slightly cheaper brand than certainly what would be used at an AFL level. And as such, that has an impact on uh, what metrics we can use. So we, you know, we tend to stick to duration, distance, work rate, high intensity running, both absolute and relative, and then obviously max speed. So they're kind of our key fundamental metrics that we would use. From a GPS point of view, how do you use it to periodize a uh, footballer's training program? Yeah, so that's a, a really good question. And again, um, data would probably make it a bit easier to, to, to describe, but um, it, it's very much done in conjunction with the coaching group. So in my role, um, I'm working really closely with the uh, first 18 coaching group at Xavier. I, I'm really lucky that I've got a coaching group that really understands and relates to to, to GPS and, and it's important. So um, obviously it's done in conjunction with the coaching group and it does require quite a few steps. So Obviously, one of them you've already touched on, and that is um, formulating a drill database because essentially without that drill database, one, it's really hard to identify um, session themes that are important um, and, and then also session themes that sort of are intertwined to the different periodization phases and different types of training sessions. And then the other aspect to that is how do you then cross-reference your, your actual sessions that, you've, that you're completing in relation to what you predicted and that's i think that's a really key concept and that's where you can't do that without having access to a drill database what are some sort of common questions that you find parents that that are, that are interested in gps are asking for, for potentially parents that are listening in um, that are interested maybe to invest in gps uh, for their child maybe their school doesn't go to uh, or their club doesn't use gps yeah what are some common questions from parents yeah, I think the big one is, um, I, and I think this is probably, a, um, this refers back to like, you know, I'm sort of fast forwarding a bit in terms of it's a mistake as well. So one of the biggest issues is pe parents and students as well, um, they associate GPS data with uh, with performance, like that is, could not be further from the truth. So I think one thing we should definitely dispel here is that GPS is not a performance metric. It's, you know, it's simply a byproduct of what's happened in a game or a training session. And it's largely underpinned by um, your physical quality. So, for example, if you have an athlete that doesn't possess great max speed, well, they're going to find it more challenging to I hit, hit a high max speed and also they're going to be challenged in terms of hitting high absolute and relative high-intensity running metres. So I think that is a really key concept and I try and ingrain that really early with our students and our, and our families so that they don't think that high is better or more is better with, when it comes to GPS. What are some sort of common mistakes from strength and conditioning coaches that are um, utilising GPS as a tool? Yeah, so I'm glad I've dispelled the first one. So that's that's I, I think that's a really serious issue when people use GPS. Um, so I'm glad we've we've been able to broach that. Um, another one that I think happens quite a lot is uh, schools or clubs when they collect GPS data, they don't actually present it or report it to the students or the athletes. So I think if you're capturing the data on, on your athletes, like it's only fair to share it with them. So um, I think that's really important. And then obviously it ties into one of the initial points I made around making sure the data is both relatable and understandable. So it resonates with with the students and they understand why you're capturing the data and, and what it means for them as well. So how do they get better and how do they improve and what do they need to focus on for subsequent games and training sessions? So I think that's that's really important. Um, this is probably tied more into training session reporting, um, not providing context. So I think one thing I'm really big on is when you're providing a training report and a particular report to coaches where you might be reporting on different training drills and what they elicit, um, it's providing context. When you start doing that process, do you find that your ability to make 
decisions on the fly within a session more sound because of the the process of reflection? Yeah, so that's an interesting one. So uh, Jared alluded to the fact that they track GPS live. Um, again, our, our units have the capacity to do that through a, an iPhone, but the issue we have with that method is we can't cut any data whilst we're doing it. So there's just like heaps of data creep and it becomes pretty redundant. So we don't mm. track live. And I think to your point, I think it's a combination of knowing the game and then also overlaying that with GPS data. I think that gives you a real capacity to understand and assess drills on the fly. So for example, yeah. on a Tuesday night, and again, I'm not saying, <laughs> trust me, by no means is this system perfect. There's definitely been, been been occasions where, particularly on a Tuesday night, where the drill um, the drill selection potentially has overshot what I wanted. But I think by and large, what happens there is you can accommodate by changing the Thursday, for example, or you can discuss it with the coaches. But for example, it might be um, on a Tuesday night there might be a drill that has too much high speed running, so it's too expansive, and there's there's um, too much pressure in it. So then, by virtue of doing that, the students, you know immediately lift their intensity because they feel like they're going to get tackled by someone or they're or they're getting pressured so those types of things you can pick up on the on the fly and i think it's once you see the impact of those types of changes to training in the gps data it then just adds credence to 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 i guess the the, the eye test you know you start to see um you start to see those things unfold and you can you can sometimes you can intervene live other times you've got to wait retrospectively to assess the 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 damage and then uh, and then you can sort of report on it and then have a conversation around it